when around 1,200 representatives of national and international Catholic lay organizations came together at the first World Congress of the Lay Apostolate in Rome in October 1951, the absence of delegates from Eastern Europe is obvious. Accordingly, the Congress explicitly commemorated the so-called persecuted church and the victims of atheist ideologies in its final declarations. Pope Pius XII himself deplored in his address to the participants of the Congress the fate of the incarcerated priests and the countries in which, to quote the Pope, Pope the church is persecuted like in the first centuries of Christendom. During the Congress, the Conference of International Catholic Organizations, um, for simplicity I will just call it the Conference uh, in this talk, a uh, central umbrella organization for several dozen uh, international Catholic organization, organizations acting in close accordance with the Holy See, felt inspired to set up the Commission pour l'Église Persécutée, the Commission for the Persecuted Church, or um, let's call it short, the Commission. Um, to, to address the problem of the Catholic Church behind the Iron Curtain. In its first three years, the Commission was a small group of four to five lay Catholics and clerics, chaired by its permanent president, Jean Bernard. A priest originating from Luxembourg, Bernard took over as the director of the Catholic daily newspaper, Luxembourg Wort after World War II, and more importantly, he led the International Catholic Organization for Cinema for a quarter century between 1947 and 1972. However, the driving force within the Commission in its early years was not Bernard, the president, but the editor-in-chief of the Catholic press agency Kipa, Ari Marnier. Canon Marnier was also the decisive link to the man who would profoundly change the character of the Commission from the shadows. Since the early 1950s, the international lawyer Jean Goulet worked as a fixer for Antoine Pinet, a leading French politician, and started building a small, informal, and sometimes a conspiratorial network of influential personalities around the French statesman which consisted mainly of leading Christian Democrats and lay Catholics from France and Germany. Here one of the very few images available of Pionet on the left with uh, Pina and Adenauer. Apparently George Clooney is not the only personality who likes to have a good time at the Lake of Como, so this is this group also met uh, secretly at the shores of the lake in, uh, in the late 1950s on this instance. This transnational group, whose members shared a vision of a Catholic Europe, united in defense against the threat of communism, soon included Father Marc Yves Marcuat, a leading agent of the Vatican, and Marmier of the Commission. Around the same time, Violet also became an agent of the French Foreign Intelligence Service the Service de la Documentation Extérieure et du Contre-Espionnage, STZE, a position from which he was able to convince his employer, the French Intelligence Service, as well as the National German Intelligence Service, the Bayern Group, or what would later become the Bundesnachrichtendienst, to fund a joint undertaking that would later be known as Operation Pax, and was largely run to the Commission. With both intelligence services, the French and the Germans, starting to contribute a monthly sum of five to six thousand French francs to its activities, the Commission was fundamentally restructured and enlarged in the fall of 1954. Louis Gautier, who well, uh, was well connected in intelligence circles as a former director of the State Police of Fribourg, a Swiss state, was installed as the secretary and vice president of the commission. Uh, and he established the commission's office in Fribourg. As it started liaising with French intelligence, 
the somewhat unusual Catholic group maintained close and constant links to the um, Holy See, who approved all its activities, either directly or through the conference. Owing to the new financial opportunities, the activities of the Commission were greatly expanded in the, uh, in the years following 1954. Um, showing a remarkable diversity, they can be grouped into three categories which corresponded in principle to the three dimensions of the apostolate according to the French or more precisely the French-Belgian model of Catholic action including social, the social, the political and the spiritual. One pillar of the Commission's activity was the organization and coordination of material aid for church institutions behind the Iron Curtain. For this undertaking, the Commission worked together with the Missio Catholic Suisse, the Catholic Mission of Switzerland, which at the beginning of the 1950s already organized shipments reaching religious houses, seminaries, convents, and concentration camps for priests in a range of countries under communist rule. This original modest charity service was greatly expanded when the Commission's money started pouring in. The parcels sent behind the Iron Curtain, and also to Vietnam, interestingly, were filled with goods and as varied as clothes, shoes, glasses, linen, uh, food or drugs, but also with a plethora of religious books and other religious texts. This is just an example of the religious literature that was sent to the Soviet Republic of Lithuania um, just within a couple of weeks in summer of 1956, really a broad range of uh, religious texts and literature that were using the logistics of the, of the French and the German, that the uh, French and German intelligence services could contribute, um, were shipped to, to the Iron Curtain. In its political or more specific political undertakings, the Commission largely rejected action that directly uh, tried to directly impact political institutions, but instead employed a wide range of tactics of mass mobilization to impact public opinion in the West and alerted to the character and extent of the persecution of the Church in the states under communist rule. The persecution of religion was used to showcase to Christian audiences the ugly reality of communism, its atheist character, and absolute incompatibility with religion, which we aim to humanize these audiences, not only to communist ideology, but also to any form of detente and reproachment. To achieve these objectives, various mass media were employed that ranged from traditional outlets, such as the Catholic Press or the Catholic International Press Agency, to more invasive media like maps, exhibitions, uh, or a serial novel published in a newspaper feuilleton. In 1956, the Commission started publishing the staunchly anti-communist monthly magazine, the Echo de Persecuté, which soon found a readership on all five continents. The driving force behind the magazine and its editor-in-chief was Louis Gautier. In the style of an intelligence operation, he set up a network of sources based on whose reports the Echo published periodical information on the situation of the church in uh, each individual state under communist rule. The most significant effort to target global public opinion was the Red Book of the Persecuted Church. Um, I have a copy with me, even if it's not really published uh, as a Red Book, but more as a Black Book. Um, I'm happy to, to circulate it around after, after the talk if someone wants to, to have a look uh, inside the book. Um, it's a large documentary of the history of religious persecution in the, in the communist ruled countries in Eastern Europe and East Asia. Apparently, the Commission was not itself involved in the, pro in the production of the Red Book, but chosen as a front group for its publication and tasked with its distribution. Published first in Italian and French, the Red Book was submitted to Pius XII in May 1956. The Pope received Bernard, Gautier, and Marnier on this occasion, commending them 
for their uh, commending them highly for their work and underscoring its extreme importance. In the next year and a half, editions in Spanish, English, German, and Portuguese followed. Secret intelligence money provided by Yule allowed the Commission to plan a global diffusion of the Red Book, all as it described it itself, on a very big scale. Elaborate national propaganda campaigns were set up, and the Red Book was even distributed behind the Iron Curtain. In addition to these rather traditional media political propaganda, the Commission also exploited specifically religious practices for anti-communist mass mobilization. Importantly, it organized various prayer campaigns, often using its official mandate by the conference to mobilize the international Catholic organizations as a multiplier. Days of prayers for the persecuted church were initiated from the Netherlands to Mexico and so-called Sundays of the Persecuted, prepared in various dioceses. Besides the action upon public opinion, this action to prayer was considered as one of two central modes of action. Bernard, the president of the commission, even spoke of a two-fold crusade. In July 1957, Pope Pius XII reacted for, to demands voiced by, voiced by the commission by composing a, pri a prayer for the silent church. In the next two years, the commission, which was officially entrusted with its diffusion, translated the prayer into 19 languages and printed and distributed hundreds of thousands of copies on both sides of the Iron Curtain. However, as I argue it would be wrong to understand the commission's mobilization of Christians to pray for the persecuted church solely or even primarily as a mobilization to an act of creed and an appeal to God. The commission mainly regarded the practice of prayer as an effective resource to spread its message about the communist persecution of the church. By portraying the cry of distress of Catholics under communist rule, the prayer of Pius XII and similar prayers were supposed to emotionally move its readers and as they called it internally, wake up the Catholics to the rigorous command to fight the injustice of our time. Far from being understood as a passive appeal to a metaphysical force, the members of the commission conceived of the prayer as a generator of action. Prayers were thus used as a specific religious resource at their disposal to mobilize lay Catholics for the struggle against communism. The spiritual and political propagandistic double crusade of the 1950s focused on the anti-communist immunization of audiences in the free world. Besides this offensive approach, the, com uh, the Commission also envisioned a more offensive approach. Based on the belief that the Catholic Church, with its deep roots in Central and Eastern Europe, constituted a major and even insurmountable obstacle for communism, the, com the Commission regarded Catholicism as the focal point for a rollback of the communist system. Besides the material aid and especially the setting of religious texts, this offensive approach was initially pursued mainly through the Oeuvre Académique de l'Église Persécuté, uh, could be translated as the academic work of the silent church, which enabled promising use from communist rule countries who were deemed, I quote, susceptible to re-Christianize one day their homelands to pursue their studies at the University of Fribourg. With Gautier acting as the president and another commission acting as the secretary, the Oeuvre Académique was essentially a front organization of the commission, with the aim to form a Catholic elite in select communist states. However, this Oeuvre Académique remained a small operation with the number of supported students fluctuating between six and ten youths coming from four countries, uh, namely Poland, Vietnam, Yugoslavia, and the Soviet Republic of Lithuania. It was not before the 1960s that the Commission moved the target of its main activities beyond the Iron Curtain. Um, at that time, to demonstrate it with their internal sketch, 
at that time the focus of their double phase action switched or moved from a, a dialogue about the persecuted church between the Catholics in the West that was multiplied to the various Catholic organizations to a true dialogue and the true exchange with the persecuted church um, exploiting or using fissures in the Iron Curtain. Um, in this field, the Commission plans to uh, coordinate, or in, primarily coordinate already existing initiatives, uh, particularly in the field of material aid, but also wanting to set up new initiatives. Most remarkably among them, they set up Radio Omega, which was the first and as its time only clandestine religious radio station that directed religious broadcast to Russia between 1962 and 1965. Although it is not clear when exactly and under which circumstances the flow of intelligence money mediated by Bule had run drag uh, on the, although it is not clear when exactly and under which circumstances the flow of intelligence money uh, that came in through Bule had run dry at the end of the 1960s. Unfortunately, the exact details are not clear yet from the source material. But this, of course, forced the Commission to develop new source of funds, and fortunately, much of its traditional activities could be covered by a Sunday offertory that was collected especially for the persecuted church um, once a year in the Diocese of Luxembourg. The radio operation, on the other hand, was funded by several sponsors whose identities, despite several indications and with the exception of the financial contribution of the Vatican, was documented, are not revealed by the available source material. The radio section of the commission was led by Father Jan Vierens from the Belgian town of Scheut, who had been detained for six years as a missionary in China. After Louis Gautier, the secretary, had died unexpectedly, and some say mysteriously, in August 1962, Fierens also took over as secretary of the commission as a whole and moved its secretary to Brussels, where the radio section was already located since the previous year. Radio Omega's covered Russian language broadcasts into the Soviet Union one hour every day were technically executed by the National Alliance of Russian Solidarists, the NTS, through a transmitter that the staunchly anti-communist clandestine organization of Russian exiles, which has also sent sabotage and espionage teams into the Soviet Union, had been using since 1950 to broadcast its own clandestine Radio Free Russia. The Commission paid the NTS for its controversial service, which sometimes also included translation work, around 8,000 to 10,000 Swiss fra every month, would be roughly 15,000, a little bit more than 50,000 bucks a day if we account for inflation since the 1960s. In 1956, at the time of the Red Book, the Commission had argued that no dialogue was allowed to take place with the Communists. In spring 1963, the group fundamentally changed that strategy and started calling forcefully for contacts between East and West and a constructive dialogue with the Communists, with convinced Communists even. This dialogue was conceived as a dialogue between the people in the West and the East taking place in personal face-to-face -face conversations between two individual human beings. The Christians were expected to enter these conversations with an open, prudent, and confident attitude, with the aim to convince the communists, at the end of a truly dialogic process, process that their ideal and idealism, the good of man in society, finds a more complete realization in Christianity rather than in Marxism. Pursuing this new approach under the influence of its new secretary, Jan Fierens, the Commission developed what Fierens later termed himself positive anti-communism, as opposed to the negative anti-communism that it replaced. Positive was this reconceptualization of anti-communism insofar as it actively accepted positive aspects in communism 
and made positive contributions to a dialogue as well as to Christianization of society. In spring 1963, such ideas were still widely rejected in avant-garde among anti-communists, secular or religious of kind. To provide Catholics with the preparation necessary to succeed in, the, in this fascinating apostolate, as they called it, the Commission started without the psychological conditions of the apostolic dialogue, its laws and its mechanisms. To an empirical, systematic approach, Fierns and his colleagues attempted to know and make know the mentality of the people behind the Iron Curtain, especially used in Russia, and not the mentality of their leaders as the Western criminologists had been studying for so long. Starting in the mid-1960s, the Commission then promoted tourism. In concrete terms, holidays of Western Christians in Eastern Europe as the main instrument to enable this constructive dialogue. The choice of tourism didn't just come from the perception that it was another fissure in the Iron Curtain, but that it was actually the only mode of contact between the two blocks on a vast scale. From 1965 onwards, the preparations of Christians, tourists traveling behind the Iron Curtain became accordingly the central activity of the Commission as it edited. This is a um, few images from the radio operation. Can come back one day in the QA maybe on that. But this is the preparation for, uh, for tourists, Western tourists traveling to Eastern Europe. Uh, published ahead of the summer holiday seasons and di distributed with great success through major travel agencies and the Catholic mass organizations. To conclude, in addition to the elaboration of religious persecution in the communist world as a propaganda team in the 1950s, the commission's significance for the course of Cold War history lies primarily to the systematic development and propagation of what he called positive anti-communism. Over two crucial decades, the activities of the Commission, who phased out in the early 1970s, combined in a truly unique way the strategies of the cultural Cold War and the secret Cold War of spies and intelligence agencies with modes of actions developed by Catholic action. In close cooperation with international Catholic organizations and the Vatican, the Commission used religion in myriad ways to meet its political ends demonstrating the constantly porous boundaries between the political and the religious realms. Thank you for your attention.